Don't change that vision while we pause for a brief commercial break. This is TomorrowPictures.tv. children. Twenty miles from Selma, several shots were fired. The driverless car veered off the highway and came to a stop at a cattle fence. Mrs. Liuzzo was dead. Arrested and charged with murder were three alleged members of the Ku Klux Klan. One was tried, and the jury was unable to reach a verdict. This is an earthen dam, the temporary grave of three civil rights workers, two white, one Negro, Mickey Schwerner, Andrew Goodman, and James Cheney, beaten and shot to death. Among those indicted for this triple slaying were six men identified as members of the Ku Klux Klan. None has been brought to trial. In this automobile, Reserve Lieutenant Colonel Lemuel Penn was killed by a shotgun test while riding through Colbert, Georgia. Arrested for this crime were four Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. Two Klansmen were tried and acquitted. In a few short months, five murders, 13 alleged members of the Ku Klux Klan said to be involved in the killing. When such an order as this moves in and takes over the police power, you are completely at their mercy. And their atrocities and their violence can be visited on anybody that disagrees with them in any given situation. What started as a joke a hundred years ago, when a group of men donned bedsheets for a romp, has over the years attracted to it persons charged with acts of harassment, intimidation, and violence throughout the South. Even though the nation has been outraged for many years, the Ku Klux Klan persists with its bizarre ritual and trappings. But a hundred years is a long time for a joke. CBS Reports presents the Ku Klux Klan, the Invisible Empire. Here is CBS News correspondent Charles Kuralt. Good evening. The Ku Klux Klan is a secret organization that has been allowed to exist in this country. Virtually every president of the United States in the past century has said the Klan has little regard for constituted authority. President Johnson, following the murder of Mrs. Liuzzo in Alabama, defined the Ku Klux Klan as a hooded society of bigots and warned Klansmen to get out of the Klan and return to a decent before it is too late. It is Sunday the morning after a Ku Klux Klan meeting in Durham, North Carolina. These men are members of the United Clans of America, Knights of the Ku Klux Klan, one of the most exclusive organizations in America. It excludes many Protestants, all Roman Catholics, Jews, Negroes, Spanish Americans, Puerto Ricans, and anyone else who, according to the Ku Klux Klan, is not 100% pure American. I don't hate niggers, man. I don't, I don't, I don't associate with niggers. On the other hand, I don't associate with common white trash or Jews or Catholics, if I can help it. This is the Grand Dragon of the North Carolina realm of the United Clans, J. Robert Jones, former sailor, bricklayer, lightning rod salesman. He now reportedly rules over more than 50 claverns, or chapters, and their 7,000 dues-paying members. I think the nigger has rights in this country. He should have equal rights, but separate rights. It's worked for 100 years in the South, and I think it will work now. But if he was the nicest fella in the world, and and Lyndon Johnson said, I had to associate with you every day. I tell Lyndon Johnson to go straight to hell because I would not associate with you. This is the Grand Consul, the late Matt Murphy, who until his recent death was chief legal counsel of the United Clans. His favorite targets were the Negroes, Jews, the Fetistim, and international bankers. I had made speeches before the United Clans of America, and they were the only organization that ever went on record after I had talked for two solid hours on the viciousness of the Federal Reserve Corporation and how it has built the taxpayers and the American citizens out of all the money, and that Great Britain has removed the bank from the international bankers, and their bank is back under the crown. This is a Nighthawk of the United Clans in North Carolina. 
A night hawk is responsible for the security of a clavern. Uh, why did you join the clavern? Well, I've got a wife, five kids. I think that's enough reason. I want them to be, have a country to raise, be raised up in like I was. I wasn't forced to go to school with niggers. I wasn't forced to eat with them. And I want them to have at least the right that I had. So this act this is Mr. Outlaw. Wherever Jones goes, Mr. Outlaw, the grand Clexter or guard, is at his side. In the group are the three defendants indicted for the killing of Mrs. Liuzzo, Eugene Thomas, William Eaton, and Collie Leroy Wilkins. These men had little to say. They preferred listening to their counsel, Matt Murphy, Jr. I read in my history books, there's a nigger man, the nigger race was an inferior race. And that was a history that was taught me when I was in school. That hadn't been too long ago. They always have been, they always will be. Well, where do you think the money is coming from behind the civil rights movement? From the Communist Party, from the Zionist Christ-killing Jews. And I say Christ-killing Jews because they have not been a flood since they, since they crucified Christ. And their relatives can be traced back to the ones that's running the streets today. What about the role of the Catholics in this, Mr. Jones? Uh, the reason a Catholic cannot get in this organization, his first allegiance is not to the United States of America. His first allegiance is to the Pope. They believe that the church should rule the government with the Pope at the head. And if they're right, there's a bunch of people in this country that are wrong. Let me uh, say this. We have never had a drop of blood spilled between a white man and a black one in any town in North Carolina that we had the Klan organized. Where and we are doing our best to keep down trouble. But my people are, everybody in this country is organized with the exception of the white Protestant Gentiles. Your niggers have your knights of your NAACP in court, along with your sorry white trash. You've got uh, Benabarith for your uh, Jewish people, your Knights of Columbus, which is a secret fraternal order, as they say, and nobody's ever talked about investigating that, which they should, uh, in here. But the white Protestant Gentile, the only hope and the only salvation that they have left in this United States today is the, is the United Klan's of America Incorporated. We saved the South twice, or the Klan has, and it looks like we're going to have to do it again. And One important Ku Klux Klan official was not at this meeting, the Klan Clud, or chaplain. But there was a clud in action the night before. You got a bunch of people standing right over here with the cameras and the news things. Half of them ain't got enough backbone to get them a job and go to work. And there might be some good ones in the crowd. I want to tell you, fellas, I'm, I'm just telling you, you fellas right over here, they'll print half of the story. They ain't got enough backbone to tell the truth. So anybody that's alive or the devil, you're going to die and go to hell without God. This is the Klan Clud in action. The preacher, evangelist, the hellfire speaker, the rabble rouser. He entertains with a mixture of comedy and Christianity. But above all, he preaches racial hatred. Then do you think children is brought up to mix the black and white together? Do you know your horse won't mix with your cow? Your dog won't mix with your hog? And you tell me white people have got a mind and can't think no clearer than that. <laughs> Listen, friend, we need to turn to God. We need to wake up to God. We had forefathers die to give us freedom. Our forefathers walked barefooted in the snow and fought and died to give us freedom. And now here we sit back because we got a dictator in the White House, a dictator, and you sit in your money down out of bed and ain't willing to stand up and be counted like a man or It takes a man to stand and be a man. Anybody can go down to nigger town and commit adultery with a nigger, but it takes a Christian, a man to stand for God. Let me call you farmers to attention to a few things. He raised hogs, and you know when the old hog has a gang of little pigs, she'll try to protect them. You'll know the dog, when they have a gang of pups, they'll try to protect them. And you tell me you got a gang of white children running around in your yard, and you're going to stand by and see them sold out to a bunch of niggers. God help you to wake up and try to do what God will have you do. Protect you all. Act like a decent person. And then if you don't want to do that, don't be a hand-handed hypocrite. Don't be one-sided. Go on to nigger town, forget about it. <laughs> 
The Klan was born a hundred years ago in Pulaski, Tennessee, as a six-member social club. But six years later, the Klan had half a million members, and the burning cross, the Klan trademark, became a symbol of the violence it used to keep the newly freed Negroes in their place. In 1915, D.W. Griffith produced and directed what has been called the first great feature-length motion picture, The Birth of a Nation, whose subject was the Ku Klux Klan. Today, this film, made 50 years ago, is still shown to Klansmen as the classic example of what other generations of Southerners did to protect white supremacy. These are some scenes from The Birth of a Nation. A chance witnessing of two white children under a bedsheet scaring a group of Negro children is depicted as the birth of the idea for the Klan. The idea is successful. Robed and masked Klansmen are able to frighten the Negroes. In a fight, the Negro sought for scaring a white girl and causing her to jump from a cliff to her death kills a white man. Captured, the killer is taken into the woods and put on trial. The clan passes judgment. The culprit is killed and his body deposited at the door of the lieutenant governor. In the same year the birth of a nation was first released, a new leader rose to head the clan. William Joseph Simmons, one-time salesman of ladies' garters, in this rare newsreel film, leads his followers up Stone Mountain in Georgia for the first initiation ceremony of the reincarnated clan. Simmons added something new to the clan uniform, a stylized face mask, which he alone could wear. He also insisted the clan operate in total secrecy. The Klan's sinister power grew as new recruits joined, some through coercion, and its clandestine activities increased. In the first 14 months after World War I, 70 Negroes were lynched, 14 burned. In 1922, Imperial Wizard Simmons could not overcome intra-Klan difficulties and was replaced by a dentist from Dallas, Dr. Hiram Evans, who inherited a depleted treasury from Simmons as well as his title of Imperial Wizard. In 1923, Evans established headquarters in Washington to be closer to Congress, the Klan's next target. The Klan was so powerful in Oregon in 1923 that it was able to elect the President of the State Senate and the Speaker of the House. In Ohio, Klan-supported candidates became mayors of Toledo, Akron, Columbus, and other cities. At the National Democratic Convention in New York in 1924, it is estimated that at least 350 delegates were Klansmen, and they were responsible for the defeat of Governor Alfred Smith as the Democratic nominee. By 1925, the Ku Klux Klan was big business. Almost six million Americans now belonged to the Klan, and the organization was grossing $75 million a year. Some 40,000 Klansmen and Klanswomen crowded into Washington on August 8, 1925 to parade down Pennsylvania Avenue. To help the Klan coffers, a flag was used to catch money thrown in by spectators. In the 1920s, the Imperial Wizard of Indiana, David C. Stevenson, was indicted on charges of assault and battery, rape, mayhem, kidnapping, and murder, and found guilty. This scandal caused a sharp drop in Klan membership. In 1940, there was a mild flirtation between the German-American Bund, the believers in the master race, and the Ku Klux Klan, the believers in the supremacy of the white race. They joined up in a rally at Camp Nordland, New Jersey. The Klan. 25 years later, there is evidence that Klan-Nazi friendship is being revived. This year in Houston, Texas, Gerald Walraven, claiming membership in the United Klans, Knights of the Ku Klux Klan, was interviewed by radio station KTRH and was paid by check for his appearance. When the Kansek was returned to the radio station, it had been endorsed by Lincoln Rockwell, head of the American Nazi Party, with a swastika stamped beneath his signature. In 1944, Imperial Wizard Dr. James H. Kolska bill from the U.S. Collector of Internal Revenue for $685,000 for the Klan's back taxes. 
Unable to pay, Dr. Colescott disbanded the Klan. But four years later, Colescott's former partner, Dr. Samuel Green, reactivated the Klan, and many new converts were initiated into Klandom, motivated by a desire to keep the Negro in his place. At a rally in Macon, Georgia, Imperial Wizard Green defended the new Klan. We don't hate the Negro. God made him black, and he made us white. And you will find this laid out in the 11th chapter of Genesis, in which he segregated the races. And we knowing that for 5,000 years, the white man has been the supreme race, we the Knights of the Klux Klan intend to keep it the white race. Today, the organization differs from the past in that Klansmen are willing to appear in their robes and hoods in daylight. With the advent of the civil rights struggle, the Klan has become more militant. Some groups have paramilitary units, such as this one in North Carolina. Grand Dragon Jones security guards are trained to take care of anything that might happen at Klan rallies. The Klan also sponsors softball teams. Since softball can't be played in robes, KKK letters appear on the uniform to remind the spectators that this team is made up of 100% pure white American Protestant ball players. Sometimes Klansmen engage in more bizarre sport. The letters KKK were carved with a penknife on the chest and stomach of this man in Houston, Texas, after he had been hanged by his knees from an oak tree and flogged with a chain. The Attorney General of Alabama, Richmond Flowers, who is currently investigating the Ku Klux Klan in his state, told us, The Klan to me, as a group primarily of thugs that would use the civil rights issue to foster an organization or a clan as they are uh, and will take the law into their own hands. They have become more or, less, more or less their own police power. They are a police group within themselves, dedicated to defiance of law, uh, violence. They are, as I have expressed it before, they are a hooded bunch of killers and night riders and uh, floggers that this nation and this state has no use for whatsoever. The strength of the Ku Klux Klan is difficult to estimate. Among its many secrets is the actual membership total. Students of Klan affairs say there are at least 30 to 50,000 active members. But there are probably as many as a million or more Americans who are strongly sympathetic to the aims of the Klan and who, if pushed to a decision, would join the Klan. When a 100% pure white American citizen applies for membership, his application is carefully checked. If accepted, he can then leave what the Klan calls the alien world and become a member of the Invisible Empire. For the first time in Klan history, CBS News cameras filmed part of a secret initiation ceremony at a clavern in Georgia. Filming had to be done with available light, and the only parts of the ritual we could not film were the secret handshake the password by which Klansmen identify themselves to each other, and the secret oath of allegiance to the imperial authority of the Klan. This is the ceremony we filmed. Bye -bye. Five initiates appeared before an exalted cyclops, a cloakard, clud, and clagrap, corresponding to a president, lecturer, chaplain, and secretary. The men were presented by the cloakard, and they had been checked out by the cloakan, or investigating committee. On a makeshift altar before an electrified cross are placed a sword representing ancestral courage and a flag, the emblem of pure patriotism. An open Bible is laid on the flag. 
A glass of water, which is used to consecrate the initiates, completes the symbolic array. Clarego, or inner guard, sits at the door. On the other side is a clexter, or outer guard. The cloakard and two assistants report to the exalted Cyclops. You actually, sir, five men in waiting have even to do to qualify them. This is the eyes of scrutiny part of the initiation ceremony. Clan members pass by the initiates for one last searching look. You may pay them. Right? Hey! Forward, Lord! In this room, the initiates swear allegiance to the clan above all things. The secrecy and ritual of these meetings, which seem almost laughable to the outsider, have a grimly serious purpose. Because of its secrecy, the clan can hold sway over a community. When men are initiated into clandom in rituals such as this one, their neighbors will not know they have become clansmen. If some of the initiates are policemen or sheriff's deputies, their fellow officers will not know. If they are jurors, their fellow jurors will not know. Under the cloak of this secrecy, the clan can take over positions of influence and power. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We recognize our relation to the government of the United States of America, the supremacy of its constitution, the union of states thereon, and the constitutional laws thereof. And we shall ever be true in the faith of maintaining the white supremacy, and will strangely oppose any compromise thereof in any and all things. Are you a native-born white Gentile American citizen? Yes. Do you believe in the tenets of the Christian religion? Yes. Do you esteem the United States of America and its institutions above any other government, civil, political, or ethical in the whole world? Yes. How yes. you feel on your right hand. And one and all, let us pray. There, you may not write. There, you are no longer able to pray with among us, but a citizen with us. And assuming that you haven't sworn, sworn false or deceitfully and assuming your oath, <coughs> now on behalf of all clan and assembly, Welcome you to citizenship in the invisible empire, Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. The five new clansmen are no longer part of the alien world. Now they are members of the invisible empire, entitled to wear the robe and the hood, 
the proud possessors of the secret handshake and the secret password. And now they can attend clavern meetings and clan rallies, such as this one in Dunn, North Carolina. Clan Rally has many elements of a carnival. It's an outing for the family. Children start attending these outdoor meetings at an early age. Robes for the youngsters are made by mothers and follow the pattern of adult robes. Rallies always have entertainers, and their material is clan tailored for the audience. This entertainer recites a poem. The saddest story ever told. When a white girl marries a negro, her son of light goes down, and glaring spots of sin appear on her wedding gown. And white and black men stand aghast while feeling this strange robe and mutter. They will wreck themselves and damn each other's soul. Three days and nights she felt black lips pressed smug against her own, and on the fourth her troubled soul let out a frightened groan. And so I staggered through my days far from God's love and grace, Till now, I know no black man lives, can take a white man's place. Thanks. The featured speaker is usually a well-known personality. At this rally, it was the late Matt Murphy, Jr., Imperial Consul or Chief Legal Counsel of the United Clans. And I'll tell you this, and go to your congressman, ask him what to do, and tell him what to do, because they're about to pass a bill out there that if you strike your civil rights worker, it's a federal offense. And they'll haul you before a federal court and take you to the most favorable county they can find and cut your head off if they can. And when I say cut your head off, I mean they'll send you to the federal penitentiary. That's the way they're doing it. That's the way they call the shots. So for God's sake, get your congressman, and if he doesn't do it, elect somebody that will fight such a bill as that. As extra added attraction, Matt Murphy introduced the three men indicted for the murder of civil rights worker Mrs. Viola Liuzzo. Mr. W.O. Eaton. <laughs> Mr. Eugene Thomas. Hey! The boy who stood under the battle guns, Colin Leroy Wilkins. Hey! And befitting the occasion of a Ku Klux Klan rally, the three men were besieged by autograph hunters, and they willingly obliged. Klan members accused of crimes must be defended. Their consuls or attorneys must be paid. In addition, money is required for operating expenses and leaders' salaries, which run as high as $1,500 a month. The Invisible Empire needs a treasury. But where the money comes from and how much is a secret. What is known is that initiation fees are between $10 and $25, and yearly dues for assessments range from $3 to $15. A conservative estimate is that the Klan is a million-dollar-a-year enterprise. The money comes from initiation fees, dues, robe and hood sales, individual contributions, and from what can be raised by a Klan clud at a rally. There might be a businessman that's prosperous and you can afford to give a thousand. You can afford to pay one of the men's salary. There might be a businessman, there is. There may be some company that can write a check for one man's year's salary to do nothing but set up units throughout North Carolina. Whatever you have, ten dollars, dollars, walk down with it. Will you do that? Is there others? You know we ought to be able tonight, we ought tonight to be able to come way on up the ladder. <laughs> We're going to count this. The men and women in robes receive torches and the parade around the kuklos, or circle, begins. Thank <laughs> you. 
What you are watching, 700 robed and hooded men marching around a burning cross, took place in the United States in 1965. Leaders are sensitive about the reputation the Klan has for intimidation and violence. In an attempt to erase this image, they have adopted a new policy which in effect says, look at us, we are a fraternal organization, we have nothing to hide. Imperial wizards and grand dragons no longer avoid the press. Klan leaders sport crew cuts, button-down collars, and well-tailored suits. The most publicized and best organized clan leader is Imperial Wizard Robert Shelton of the United Clans Knights of the KKK. Shelton spends much of his time in his Tuscaloosa, Alabama office, constantly listening to tape recordings of Martin Luther King Jr. while he examines pictures of civil rights demonstrators. Those he can identify are circled and filed. Shelton explains why. We have a division in our organization called the KBI, the Klan Bureau of Investigation, and I might add it is pretty effective. We're able to uncover a lot of evidence that uh, other departments uh, might miss. The Klan says it does not advocate intimidation, harassment, or violence, that it is a peaceful organization. Let us take a look at some proven Klan activities. In the small community of Gray, Georgia, the only movie theater in town permitted Negroes to sit in the balcony. The Klan decided this was not a healthy thing for the white people, and every Friday night, 50 carloads of robed Klansmen circled the theater. Today, the movie house in Gray, Georgia is closed. A victory for the Klan. Further examples of Klan intimidation were uncovered in an injunction lawsuit in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals in New Orleans. The hearings revealed that in Bogalusa, Louisiana, sometimes called Klan Town, USA, some of the city's estimated 1,000 Klan members were auxiliary policemen. The city attorney, who is responsible for prosecuting charges against Klansmen arrested for violence against civil rights workers, was himself identified as a Klansman. The powerful Bogalusa Klan moved this year against radio station WBOX, whose owner was one of a group which invited former Arkansas Congressman Brooks Hayes to make a speech in Bogalusa on race relations. Klansmen made hundreds of anonymous phone calls to the station sponsors. The effect was immediate. 75% of the commercials were canceled. WBOX is still broadcasting, but at a loss. Although the Klan says it has respect for law and order, there are records of countless crimes which some Klansmen performed for reasons they deemed proper. Judge Daniel Duke, who has fought the Klan for 25 years in Georgia, tells how the Klan administered its own kind of justice. They'd have a, the Klokan committee, or the committee that administered the floggings. One would get on one side of this man who was doubled up with his wrist handcuffed to his ankles, who had been taken from his home, he thought, by a legal warrant, and who had unknown to him been reported by someone to be a labor organizer and uh, they equated that to communism and then they equated that to race mixing and they would usually equate that to say some Jewish person was back of it and uh, a multiplicity of uh, things anything that appealed to hate prejudice they'd take this man and they would beat him unmercifully the Ku Klux Klan does not stop at floggings Eight years ago, in Birmingham, Alabama, a group of Klansmen committed the most heinous crime short of murder. As a warning to civil rights leaders, they abducted this man and castrated him. Well, they hit me in the back of the head, told me to lay down. And they all grabbed me, stretched me out. Well, one stood on this arm and one stood on this one. And one caught my leg and spread it apart. Then he got help from the other one and they spread my leg apart. The boss ordered him to do your way. And they went to cutting on me. When they got through cutting me, they put term time on me. 
said I wasn't hollering, but turn down to make it hate more. I don't believe they're human. But not only individuals suffer at the hands of the Klan. Sometimes whole cities are victims. In one large city, there is evidence that Klan-inspired violence touched off one of the most vicious racial riots in recent history. The place was St. Augustine, Florida. This Klansman was primarily responsible for what happened. Reverend Connie Lynch is probably the most effective rabble-rouser and preacher of bigotry the Klan has to offer. Most people would kill you if you put a Jersey bull in among their white-faced Herefords. They'd shoot you. But they tell me that I don't even have the right to fight to protect the white race. Let these black bucks come in. They said it was going to be settled in the bedroom. Well, I got some news for them. There may be some bedroom cases, all right, but when the smoke clears away, there won't be no bedroom cases. Little Rock, Oxford, Birmingham, Albany, Georgia, Bogalusa, Louisiana, Connie Lynch was there. And when racial violence was predicted for St. Augustine, Florida, Connie Lynch went there, too. Negroes were trying to integrate the bathing beaches, and the Florida Advisory Committee to the U.S. Civil Rights Commission warned that the city was becoming a racial super bomb with a short fuse. When the police stand up on the corners and hit the white fellas in the stomach with the black bags to stand on the corners, yes. and the white people yes. are like, yes. there is yes. The tempo of violence increased rapidly in St. Augustine. The Klan paraded in the streets, unmindful of the rain. And I'll say this to the stooges, I want to take this back to the enemy's camp, to the niggers and all their cohorts, uh, that we white people are going to rise up 140 million strong. And On the night of June 25th, 1964, the fuse burned down and the racial bomb exploded. St. Augustine was the scene of a frightening riot. Scores of people were injured, 19 hospitalized. Connie Lynch had done his work. I spoke for the white people. The white people rallied behind it, and we kicked the living hell out of the niggers, sent the out-of-town niggers to the hospital and out of the state, went back to their own hometowns where they ought to have been, and the niggers in St. Augustine got quiet and went back over to nigger town where they belong. These examples of Ku Klux Klan activity are not unusual. For the past 100 years, the invisible empire, this self-proclaimed second national government, has reserved to itself police authority and the right to correct what it considers wrong. Although some Klansmen have been apprehended and tried for their crimes, the fact remains that the perpetrators of more than 225 bombings and 1,000 acts of racial violence, reprisal, and intimidation in the last 10 years have not been arrested. The problem is that law enforcement itself is often in the hands of authorities who either belong to or sympathize with the Ku Klux Klan. The publisher of the Atlanta Constitution, Ralph McGill, explains why citizens are powerless to protest in such situations. In the small community, you too often find that the sheriff is a member or that the deputies are members. And the poor white man, or more particularly, the poor Negro in a small community, he well knows that he's protection at all, that the law isn't going to help him because the law is more often than not in the Klan or sympathetic with it in the small southern community. The Klan is not a single, strongly organized group. It is composed of splinter groups fighting each other for new members and new territory. On Memorial Day weekend, Robert Shelton's chief rival, James Venable, head of the National Knights of the KKK, took his clan north to a site 25 miles from Cincinnati, Ohio. Both Venable and Shelton believed the whites in the north, worried about Negro civil rights demands in their own communities, are ready to embrace the clan. This was the first open clan rally in Ohio in more than 30 years. The fact that the Klan is getting bolder was demonstrated by the site which was selected, right alongside Superhighway 75. Klan robes, many of which had been stored away for years, were put out for an errand. Since the building of a cross for the Klan ritual requires skill, out-of-staters volunteered to hammer the cross pieces, wrap the burlap carefully, and then soak their handiwork with a mixture of gasoline and motor oil, a half gallon of gasoline and five pounds of oil for every foot of the cross. Yeah. Oh, hey, for that bell, go 
The Klan added a new touch to attract crowds, a skydiving show with parachute jumpers releasing Klan flags and then landing on Klan-blessed land. The northernmost penetration of the Klan took place last month near Cleveland, Ohio. All cars headed for the rally were searched for weapons and police confiscated high-powered rifles, shotguns and pistols. There were the usual preparations, including the raising of the cross. At a nearby restaurant, men lined up to get applications for membership in Imperial Wizard Venable's Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. That evening, 25 men and women, kept at a safe distance, picketed the meeting. The burning of the cross was the high point of this rally, only 21 miles from Cleveland. Does the invisible empire have a right to continue its activities, either in the north or the south? In our democracy, freedom of speech must be accorded this organization. Klansmen have a right to meet and wear uniforms. If the Klan is a fraternal order, it should enjoy the privileges of other orders. But the truth is that among all such organizations, only the Klan has a history of violence. Lawmakers have not ignored the Klan. 22 states have passed laws prohibiting the wearing of masks in public, and 52 southern communities have outlawed masks and cross burnings. But even these laws have been ineffective. Klansmen can still legally wear masks and burn crosses on private property. They still intimidate and harass citizens. Now, the Office of the Attorney General is working on new anti-Klan legislation commission to Congress. Attorney General Katzenbach was asked what form this legislation might take. Well, I think it could take a, uh, a number of forms. One would be to follow the analogy with respect to the Communist Party and uh, to seek uh, uh, full disclosure of their membership and a uh, listing of the uh, Klan and its members and its officers as a sort of glare of publicity. Another uh, approach, uh, perhaps a better approach, would be to follow the pattern of the existing laws, but uh, to expand their scope of, uh, of federal jurisdiction under them and to increase the penalties under them so that the federal government uh, could get a more deep involvement. We've put up with the Klan for a hundred years in this country. How long is it going to take for us to see the end of the Klan. I don't know when we'll see the end of the Klan. I think the end of the Klan is uh, any kind of an effective organization of any sort at all is within sight. I doubt that uh, the Klan is going to be a very effective force anywhere as uh, 10 years from now. Earlier in this program, we showed Reverend Roy Woodall, a Klan clud in action. A few days ago, Woodall quit the United Clans Incorporated. Last week at his home near Lexington, North Carolina, we asked him why. Well, if people would just check the record and see this, now who is leading the Klan and what are they and what do they stand for? That would be a logical question. So take any individual, what if he be in the Klan or out, check the leadership. Say, for example, we have people with the painter contractors. As far as I know, failures. We have people with uh, insurance agents. As far as I know, failures. We have people with concrete business. As far as I know, failures. And such as that, just uh, failed out and flunked out. Couldn't promote leadership and uh, just lost out everything they had. And then, well, when they couldn't find nothing else to do, as the fellow said, they made him a Klan's leader. At every Klan meeting, Reverend Whittle, they go around and collect money. What happens to that money? Where does it go? Well, as far as we know, it all finds its way in the pockets of leaders. Now, if you know where any else, when I don't myself as an individual, uh, I just couldn't tell you. Now, we know that they do take up money every rally. Now, we know that. The news knows it. Uh, everybody there knows it. They pass their buckets around, and they do take up money. But as far as we know, that's the end of it. Uh, we don't have no uh, record of nothing else as far as I know now. Somebody else may know something I don't know, but all we know is people rides around, lives in their motels, drives their Cadillac, eat their ribeye steak, and laugh at the poor people as they go by. Whatever happens to the Ku Klux Klan will not 
finally happen in Washington. It will happen in those small towns of the South whose natural spirit of generosity and justice have been damped and whose leaders have fallen silent. If the Klan prospers, it will draw its strength from such communities. If the Klan falls, it will be because one man and then another in such places have made up their own minds that a free society cannot coexist with an invisible empire. This is Charles Kuralt. Good night. Plan, the Invisible Empire, was filmed and edited by the staff of CBS Reports under the supervision and control of CBS News. Special thanks. We don't have much time to thank everybody, and especially to our friends in the business and to our wonderful friends here and all of you out there for your great loyalty. This is not goodbye. It's just good night, and we'll see you soon.